Hello and welcome to the Shift Asia in-depth series of Malaysian International Food and Beverage Trade Fair, MIFB 2024, the podcast where we dive deep, in, deep into the heart of sustainable food and beverage innovations across Asia. My name is Frida Liu, and as we build up to the Malaysian International Food and Beverage Trade Fair happening in Kuala Lumpur from July 17 to 19, each episode will shine a light on the pioneers who are reshaping the industry. So whether you're a business owner, a food enthusiast, or simply curious about the future of food, Join us as we uncover the tastes of tomorrow today. Today, we're going to discuss the dynamic landscape of sustainability within Asia's restaurant scene. As the region grapples with rapid urbanization and economic growth, its food service industry faces unique sustainability challenges and opportunities. We'll discuss with the Growth and Partnership Director of the Sustainable Restaurant Association, Carafinity, the current state of sustainable dining in Asia, including the various practices restaurants are adopting to minimize their environmental footprint. Hi, Karen, all the way from Hong Kong. Hi guys, thank you for having me today. Very excited to chat all things sustainable dining in Asia. First of all, I was just uh, surprised that there's this association, the Sustainable Restaurant Association. Um, maybe you can share a little bit about the genesis uh, behind this association. Absolutely, happy to. Um, so the Sustainable Restaurant Association has been around for quite a long time now. Um, we were founded in 2009, originally in the UK. Um, by a group of like-minded F&B and um, hospitality people. Um, the organization was originally founded um, due to uncertainty in the F&B sector in the UK around legislation that was coming in and changes that needed to happen in the hospitality sector, um, but the infrastructure wasn't necessarily there yet. Um, so the association was was, I suppose, um, was launched to help F&B people understand the nuances around sustainable dining and how we need to create a more circular economy. Um, since then, we have had quite a rapid, a rapid growth around the world. Um, we, are, we have active restaurants who have completed the Food Made Good standard, which is our global hospitality accreditation and um, to train hospitality in this and be businesses in more sustainable practices. Um, so currently, there are restaurants in 26 countries around the world who have completed the Food Made Good standard. Um, and we have partnerships in actually 75 countries around the world. So our presence is, is, is definitely known in a lot of different countries. However, in Asia, um, we have been present here for about five years now. Mm -hmm. Our main areas and um, where we have, I suppose, concentration of restaurants are Hong Kong, which is where I'm based. Taiwan, which um, we have about 250 restaurants in Taiwan who are a part of our network. Mm -hmm. And then also Japan, we have a partner in Japan who uh, brings restaurants through the Food Made Good standard. And um, we also, I suppose we're, that, that's what to say that we're not working with restaurants anywhere else in Asia. Right. And we're starting a partnership in Singapore. And we also have some partners in, in Thailand, Brendan. Right. And um, so very much happening. Okay, so slowly uh, inching your way into Malaysia. Um, there is, <laughs> we talk about, the, there is this, the food make good standard, right? Um, and what is the framework around that? So the framework around the accreditation is derived from the Global Sustainable Development Goal. And so everything that we have created in the framework is to answer those Global Sustainability Goals for businesses, our countries. And um, the framework is broken down into three sections. So businesses that take part in the Food Make Good Standards um, can do this themselves. It's an online um, do-it-yourself sort of accreditation. We do offer supports to businesses if they need it and um, additionally. And um, so there's 10 impact areas. The first area at the overarching team is around sourcing. In there, in the sourcing elements, and um, we look at celebrating provenance. We look at how businesses are supporting farmers and fishers. We look at what is the understanding of um, more of a plant and better meat. We also look at um, how businesses can source sustainably um, their seafood and anything from farm. The second section delves into um, society and how businesses are treating people that they work with. Mm -hmm. So we look at treating staff fairly, 
we look at feeding people well, and we look at how businesses are supporting the community through their sustainable initiatives. And then the last overarching section looks at the environment. Right. And the three impact areas in there are around reducing your footprint, wasting no food, and reducing, reusing, and recycling. Right. Okay. Now, when when you look at Asia, right, so diverse and, and with cultural, economic, and regulatory factors, what are some of the challenges and roadblocks uh, uh, you've seen out here in Asia? I think one of the biggest challenges that we see um especially in cities like Singapore and Hong Kong, for example, who, you know, from a legislation perspective, um, are leading the way when it comes to more sustainable society um, for the hospitality sector as well. You know, they've Singapore and Hong Kong have recently brought in um, some very stringent um, legislation around, um, you know, roadmap for hospitality businesses specifically to, to get them to a more sustainable place by 2025 or 2030. And so what we see as quite a big challenge is um, around local sourcing. Really? Um, you know, in, in bigger, in big cities like Hong Kong and Singapore, just as an example, um, there is no space for, for the farming that is needed to be able to sustain the populations here. Right. Um, so definitely local sourcing is quite a challenge. Right. Um, you know, we, we do see that even in other bigger countries where perhaps the, the produce isn't as high quality as restaurants want and maybe they're importing from Europe or they're importing mm. from um, Australia. And um, so we, we look at, when that is a challenge, we look at trying to educate businesses on tapping into whatever is available locally. Right. It doesn't have to be all, all produce. Right. And what we do try and encourage businesses to have some sort of knowledge of what is available locally. And mm -hmm. um, whether that is smaller garnishes, whether that is eggs, whether that is, um, you know, dairy to a certain extent, um, and trying to encourage them to work with whatever local sources that they can. Mm -hmm. um, so that is definitely one of the big challenges that we see here. Right. Um, you know, I think another quite common challenge in Asia is the use of plastic. Um, and again, we're, I feel as though in comparison to the EU, perhaps, and to the UK, the legislation in Asia is, is slower to catch up on this. Right. Um, just this year, in last month, in April, on Earth, Earth Day, the 22nd of April, um, the Hong Kong government government put in place the first ever ban on single-use plastics for the um, hospitality industry. Um, so quite a monumental um, piece of legislation, mm. but it's really starting to filter down now into all type of F&B um, eateries, whether that's a fine dining restaurant or a Cha Chan Tang, a local eatery. Um, and Breverville is having to really stand up and take notice of this now, but I suppose it's that it's that lack of information, lack of um, understanding around the use of plastic and how it can be um, reduced or reused right. or recycled in business. Right. You know, and how do you think, uh, you know, as a, as a restaurant, how do you think being part of the standard helps the business? How does the association support the restaurants? And the reason I'm asking that as well is that sometimes I say, oh, no, not another standard. We're trying, you know, I mean, how you're going to get some skeptics, right? So how do you, how then being part of this will help them with their business. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in a time of, um, we're seeing more and more consumers now um, care about where their their food is coming from. And so businesses are taking notice of this and how they are proving um, their value and their, I suppose their values as a business is often through accreditations and certi certifications. Um, so absolutely, there are quite a few of them out there. Um, however, how the food made good standard completely differs from everything else on the market is that we are the only um, holistic accreditation for the hospitality industry. Right. What does that mean? Um, we focus purely 100% on food right. and on food supply chains. And, and that is our 100% focus. So there is no other accreditation available in the world today that offers that to businesses. A lot of the other accreditations, they will look at um, the entire building. Um, so they'll look at, um, often it, it's focusing on hotels as well. They'll look at how 
energy is used across buildings in the rooms. They'll look at and um, they look at practices in and um, across rooms. But food is a very very small fragment of all of these other accreditations. And um, so I suppose that that can first of all the difference we differ with a lot of um, a lot of the other global certifications. I, th- I heard you ask as well. Um, how do we support businesses and what, you know, how can we help businesses through this accreditation? And um, what the Food Made Good Standard provides is education right. on the top 10 impact areas for their business. Um, the whole process is a learning process and we don't want to um, showcase how badly people are doing, you know, if, they, if they're not doing as well as they want to be. If there is a section, for example, reduce your footprint in our in our accreditation, and maybe if a business only answer it can only answer positively about five of those questions, we will give um, opportunities for improvement for the other five. We will provide templates for policies that they can create to better um, enhance their sustainable practices. We will give a full um, report after the accreditation, which is a roadmap for the next two years. Right. And um, our accreditation is completed once every two years. And um, so the roadmap that we give and the full detail report will go into very, very detailed analysis about each of the 10 impact areas and how, how businesses can improve and how we can help them improve along the way. And um, I suppose another way that we help is um, we offer strategies for decreasing carbon footprints, and right. um, which I think is obviously very important for businesses that maybe need to report from an ESG perspective and bigger group. Um, and really, we want to help businesses in the long run um, decrease their costs and in help help them to save down the line by bringing in more circular operations. Right. And I think what's really good, like you said, you, you you give them a roadmap, right? So, I mean, okay, now we know, at least I know what I need to do, what the next steps are, what I need to do, because I need to be educated and then be made aware of areas to improve, but given the steps and where to improve. Um, I know you share some stories and, um, and and maybe this is something that you can you can answer me as well. L- local sourcing, waste reduction and energy reduction solutions. And one of the partners that you've got, which is very interesting, was, was you're a star, right? And I'm like, that's 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 solving a lot of things. So if you talk about the Eurostar being all over Europe, but a little bit about that story, if you can share with us. Sure, sure. So um, we've worked with the Eurostar and I suppose they're, for people that don't know, they're obviously a um, European rail line um, that goes from the UK to Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, so we started working with them probably about 10 years ago now, and they were the first of their kind um, to accredit as uh, a food make good accredited business. Right. And they work with us in a very similar way to how we work with caterers. And so we we work with, with a lot of obviously sand yellow straws and restaurant groups, but then catering groups can obviously have quite a big impact as well and a huge SMB supply chain. And um, so they at first attempted in 2013 their first go at the Food Made Good accreditation. And, and they have worked on it every two years since then. The first time they completed the accreditation, they received one star. And um, another thing to mention about the Food Made Good accreditation is that um, it is it is a star-based um, result. Right. So you can get ranging from one star, two star to three star. Mm-hmm. Three star is the highest um, amount of stars that businesses can get. So over the last 10 years, Eurostar had worked with us to increase their star rating every single year. Right. Um, and I believe mean, in 20, I think it was just, yeah. maybe it was the start of the start of this decade, or the start of this, um, this, this the 2020, um, I believe they're currently sitting on a three-star rating. And yeah. um, so they have really improved their operations to right. create a more sustainable circular and um, operation on the Eurostar. Right. I think this is a great, uh, you know, when you look at something of that scale, right? Um, now, in the list of Asia's 50 best restaurants, the Sustainable Restaurant Award for 2024 uh, went to Haoma, Bangkok, right? And the crux of any good restaurant is still the food. So do their sustainable practices make an impact on a, on a customer's patronage decisions, do you feel? So I think I kind of touched on it earlier on and... What we're seeing from from research and also from our global network is since, I suppose, 
couple of times and I suppose the kind of how how we have evolved as consumers after that. Um, we are noticing a huge shift in consumer sentiment towards how businesses are actually operating the core. And right. um, consumers more than ever care about um, where they're dining, where they're investing, not only with F and B businesses, but across all spectrums of the consumer and the consumer sphere. But especially for hospitality, we are seeing a more conscious consumer than ever before. Right. And people are very concerned with what they are consuming, right. where it's from, what has been the lifespan of that product, and how has it gotten to the position in front of them. And, and I think it's it's the biggest shift that we've ever seen as an organization. And um, so I think this is, restaurants are taking notice of this. And mm. um, restaurants are talking about getting third party certificated because they want to be able to prove that what they're doing is good, that they're trying their absolute best right. to be better for the planet, be better for their consumers and create a more climate friendly world for all of their customers. Um, so I think we're really, really, really seeing this. I think with Paola, um, you know, they are the perfect example of this. And, um, you know, in a in a really, really busy city with, you know, not much space in the in the direct proximity of the restaurant. Right. They have managed to create a um, fully sustainable operation where they grow their own ingredients in a vertical farm. Um, and whenever they can't grow vertically in the in the farm on the grounds of the restaurant, they have created um, local partnerships to be right. able to gather up all of their ingredients. So everything is completely sourced um, with Thai ingredients. Mm. Um, so they, they're a great example of how they're doing better and still creating absolutely amazing dishes and experiences. Before I let you go, Karen, uh, what other trends are you seeing in Asia when it comes to F&B standards? And it could be around uh, sustainability or not. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think there's, I, I think for, for me, I do see a big, a big focus on sustainable seafood. And, um, you know, obviously in Asia, there's an extremely high seafood consumption level in comparison to other parts of the world. And um, so I think building knowledge of this and um, restaurants are really, really trying hard to do this. And they're doing this by partnering with organizations like WWF. Um, like NSC to be able to certify their their seafood and also by taking a lot of seafood off their menus and mm. um, that is on the endangered list and um, so really seeing a lot of that happening and um, another really great trend we're seeing is um, investing in sustainable water and mm. um, you know a big you know water and kind of water scarcity scarcity and um, are really big topics that, you know, we have to take note of. Um, so we're seeing a lot of restaurants and hotel groups around Asia. One in particular um, is Jaya House Hotel in Cambodia right. um, in Siem Reap. They're really pushing for hoteliers in the region to come together and have a um, campaign for hotels to go um, zero plastic or zero single-use plastic by 2025. Right. And um, I'm really we're asking them to reduce plastic bottled, bottled water mm. um, and look at more sustainable water for our options. So I think those are kind of the big things I've seen around Asia as a trend right now in 2024. Right. Thanks for spending time with us, uh, Karen. And you've been watching the Shift Asia in-depth series with MIFB 2024. Uh, it's a pleasure to bring today's story of innovation and impact in the F&B sector. And remember, the conversation doesn't end yet. Join us at the Malaysian International Food and Beverage Trade Fair this July uh, to see these sustainable practices in action and discover how you can be part of this exciting industry transformation.